a top story right now, draws on a new development involving one of the most strident Republican leaders in Congress, Ted Cruz. And it includes his odd apology interview with Tucker Carlson. This story reveals a picture of the current Republican Party and a warning about the authoritarianism rising on the American right. To see how important this is and how deep it runs and why this isn't just some D.C. skirmish, it's also necessary right now for us to see how Ted Cruz and the Republican Party got here. Because as the right rallies around the lies of the loser of the last election, who President Biden admonished in that fiery speech last night as a defeated, lying, former president, it is also vital to understand that Republican leaders know Trump is lying. They know how dangerous he is. They know his combination of lies, ego, and emotional temperament can pose a real danger, as Cruz himself warned so heatedly in 2016. This man is a pathological liar. What Donald does when he loses is he blames everybody else. It's never Donald's fault. Donald, you're a sniveling coward. He get, engages in insults. I think the people are interested in substance and record. Look, we need a commander in chief, not a Twitterer in chief. The man ca cannot tell the truth, but he combines it with being a narcissist. The man is utterly amoral. His reaction to everything is to throw a fit. Donald finds it very hard to lose, that, that, that he finds that very difficult for him. That's where Cruz started speaking there to largely Republican audiences and expressing things that he did not find controversial in the least. Of course, Trump was a liar. Of course, his career and Twitter life showed narcissism rather than public service. Of course, Trump was a sore loser. And that can get dangerous when the sore loser oversees a nuclear power. Everything I just said is in reference to what Cruz asserted in public repeatedly to Republicans. Cruz also knows better than most that Trump does not honor democracy and doesn't pretend to. The 2016 primaries first began with Trump losing to Cruz in Iowa, prompting Trump to immediately impugn the results and lie about them and talk about fraud, because when he loses, it's a fraud problem. There, he was, of course, accusing many Republicans of fraud. Didn't matter. Now he accuses different opponents in his mind. But Ted Cruz was on the other end of that. And then when Trump won the nomination, Cruz was still dubious enough about Trump as a potential president that Ted Cruz famously went to the RNC, got up on the podium and refused to endorse Trump in that ultimately bizarre scene where then Trump, as a candidate, disrupted it by coming out on the floor during Cruz's speech, not endorsing Trump. This history matters because that's what Ted Cruz first thought. That's what Ted Cruz apparently really thought about Donald Trump. And then as Trump solidified his grip on power, Cruz has publicly completely owned himself. He endorsed Trump, he campaigned with him, he defended every Trump action in office, and then after Trump lost to Biden, and after Trump kept attacking the election, something Cruz knew all about from his own experience, it was then Ted Cruz who led the feudal effort to challenge the certification of the Biden victory on the Senate floor. We've seen in the last two months unprecedented allegations of voter fraud. And we have an obligation to the Constitution to ensure that this election was lawful. What does it say to the nearly half the country that believes this election was rigged if we vote not even to consider the claims of illegality and fraud in this election? Conduct a 10-day emergency audit. Consider the evidence. Yes, 10 more days of all that. And what would 10 more days of sham reviews achieve? It sounded strange at the time, even to everyone covering it closely, but, well, when you gather up all the evidence from primary sources, it looks even worse because we are hearing from Trump's own White House aides, Cruz was leading a more complex authoritarian play. The idea was to use that time to then somehow decertify the results and steal the whole election. Here was Trump aide Peter Navarro on Cruz's role on the beat this week. The plan was simply this. We had uh, over 100 congressmen and senators on Capitol Hill ready to implement the sweep. At 1 p.m., Ted Cruz, Senator Ted Cruz, and Gosart, a, a representative, started the Green Bay sweep beautifully, challenging the results of Arizona. Listen closely. They are telling on themselves, and it's the context for all of this and the threat to our future elections. Not a drill. 
As you heard Navarro just say, Cruz spoke at 1 p.m. and then within the hour, a violent mob stormed the Capitol, demanding assassinations, attacking police, beating people, committing what are now convicted crimes in the courts and causing a havoc that did result in deaths, a literal insurrection, a security meltdown, an act of domestic terrorism. And this week, Cruz referred to that fact of a violent terrorist attack. We are approaching a solemn anniversary this week, uh, and it is an anniversary of a violent terrorist attack on the Capitol, where we saw the men and women of law enforcement demonstrate incredible courage. Fact check, true. Yet that very straightforward recent historical truth that you just heard him say, in his own words on Wednesday, drew huge backlash from the right-wing big lie movement, attacking Cruz for accurately referring to the truth of those crimes, the domestic terror and the violence. And Cruz immediately folded, rushing to recant everything in a very sad interview with Tucker Carlson, who, by the way, hosts a lot of misinformation about January 6th. So that's the place you go when you have to prove to people that when you said something true about the violence... You didn't mean it. So Cruz went to publicly apologize and say he was, quote, dumb to call it terrorism and sloppy in his words. And then he got his pushback in public, millions watching from Carlson. The way I phrased things yesterday, it, it was sloppy and, and it was frankly dumb. And, I don't and buy that. Result, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, I don't well, buy that. For, look, I've known you a long time since before you went to the Senate. I do not believe that you used that accidentally. I just don't. It's, so, Tucker, as a result of my sloppy phrasing, it's caused a lot of people to misunderstand what I meant. I wasn't saying that the thousands of peaceful protesters supporting Donald Trump are somehow terrorists. It's a new low after other recent new lows. Ted Cruz went from the senator who would supposedly stand up to Trump and the threat that he said Trump posed, the lies, the amorality, as Cruz called it, the attack on democracy, you know, those were the words he used to phrase the threat Trump posed. He went from that to a Trump supporter, then Trump enabler, then a Trump accomplice in trying to end democracy. And then now, with crimes on the table, he's Trump's chief lying propagandist willing to lie about the very violence that Mr. Cruz claimed to condemn one day before. He knew better five years ago, just as he knew better earlier this week. And that makes it all the more craven as a personalized reflection of the wider Republican Party's dissent. It would be ridiculous for me to be saying that the people standing up and protesting to follow the law were somehow terrorists. If you assault a police officer, you should go to jail. That's who I was talking about. I used that word all in 2020 for the Antifa and BLM terrorists that assaulted cops. I wasn't saying the millions of, of, of patriots across the country supporting President Trump are terrorists. I agree with you. It was a mistake to say that yesterday. They want to paint us as Nazis. I'm the one leading the fight in the Senate against this garbage. We're joined by Washington Post writer Gene Robinson. Your thoughts, sir? Well, I think you use the, the, the operative word, or you use the word craven, and that, that was, uh, it, it was a, a, a craven uh, uh, performance that we saw last night from Ted Cruz. Um, uh, at, at the end of, the, of this long transformation, he was very clear, as you pointed out uh, at the beginning, what he saw in Donald Trump, the danger he saw in Donald Trump, the, uh, the, the, the fact that he was totally unsuited and unfit uh, to ever be president of the United States. And, uh, and now he is waving the Trump banner because of his own craven ambition. And, uh, he, he, you know, he still wants to be president. He still thinks he can be president someday. He still thinks somehow he can inherit uh, the Trump um, base. And so, I mean, it was, it, it, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy, but, uh, but it was just an embarrassing, embarrassing uh, performance. And I, I, I just can't, it, it, was, it was hard to believe. It's difficult to watch, uh, even happening to Ted Cruz. Turning now to our annual special report. COVID is the leading cause of police deaths in the line of duty. But it's not the only epidemic that impacts officers. And 
As part of our annual report, I want to share with you what we're learning. Death by suicide, what The Washington Post calls a quiet epidemic, continues to be the cause of death for so many men and women in uniform. Now, these deaths are not always counted under the traditional metric as, quote unquote, deaths in the line of duty, but they really do show and reveal a wider way to understand the strain facing officers, because more officers die by suicide than by gunfire. In this past year, 2021, there were 130 officer deaths by suicide and 62 by gunfire. It is quite a striking fact when you look at it that way that it's more than double. Now, I mentioned the counting because this isn't just our way of looking at it. There are these organizations and the FBI that looks at the threats and challenges of police. And no official organization tracks these numbers aside from one nonprofit, Blue Help, that looks at it like this. Now, this issue came to the forefront this year when four police officers died by suicide specifically after the January 6th riot. Those deaths not counted, as I mentioned, as line of duty deaths. Now, there are mental health experts who have a different view. In the Washington Post, they write that officers have greater exposure to trauma. And in the culture of policing, they're often not inclined to ever even seek the help that they need initially. After officer suicides spiked to around 200 in 2019, a police executive research forum put out a report noting that PTSD is five times more likely among officers. Indeed, one out of 15 experienced depression, the overall risk of death by suicide, 54 percent higher for officers than the general population. So the numbers bear out what you might anecdotally think, that these things are linked, that these are very tough jobs. Officers often are found using their service weapons to take their own life. So we have a system where you have officers exposed to disturbing and traumatic experiences and sometimes for reasons that relate to resources, culture, or our general society, not getting the tools that may help them. There's a writer who suggested that if we reimagine police by hiring more social workers to help on these mental illness calls, for example, and put more money towards affordable housing, you might ease some of this burden on both the officers and the community at large. Now, this isn't just a report of what happened, it's also what can happen. A city, for example, has a pilot program of mental health assistance for officers after three were lost to suicide this year. Two Chicago officers, 47-year-old James Daly and 38-year-old Jeffrey Troglia, died by suicide in the span of one week in March. Daly fatally shot himself in a police station. The third officer, 24-year-old Christian Ferguson, died in July. Unfortunately, it's not unusual in Chicago. Twelve officers have died by suicide there over the past three years. Department leaders have brought in the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And there we heard from Chicago's CEO there, Alexa James, about these issues and exploring whether there are things that can be done better in the future, like assigning clinicians to districts for regular support. We have to individualize grief. We have to individualize what the supports look like, and we cannot just treat, have a group mentality around this department and make sure that people know that you may feel alone, people have your back 100%, and if you don't feel that way, let's have a dialogue. What we're hearing from experts and what the numbers show is we're not talking about this enough as a society, perhaps here in news and media, in law enforcement communities, in all of our communities. Late Officer Christian Ferguson died after James' arrival an indication of how serious the matter is for so many in this line of work. 38-year-old Jeff Troglio was a 15-year veteran of the department. He was celebrated as a dedicated and decorated cop. He was a husband, a father of three young girls. His family has started to go fund me after his death and already raised over $200,000 to help support the family and his daughter's education. Now, we do this report every year, and we think about the people in the line of duty who take these risks. And we honor just some of them. That's the nature of this. We don't list off every single name. But these families, they don't get their loved ones back. And we think about not only what we owe them in the past, but as a society, what might be done better in the future to improve mental health services, to face mental health and the risk of suicide, which is the leading cause of death in the United States, is something that we all need to make sure we're dealing with as thoughtfully, empathetically, and objectively as possible. Mental health is important. And then you go to the wider conditions we're all aware of. We're in the third year of this pandemic. So I will mention if you or someone you know is experiencing any kind of emotional distress, you can always call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-8255. You can also text hello to 741-741 anytime.